Hello, so this Science of Sport video looks at BTEC Sport and Exercise Sciences, Unit 2 Functional Anatomy, and in particular the skeletal system D5, which is about joints, um, and part two. So in the previous video, we looked at the different classification of joints, fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial. And this video focuses in on the synovial joints that we rely on so centrally for all our sporting movements. Specification identifies that there are six different types of synovial joint, and you'll need to be able to describe them structurally and functionally, how they're built for the job that they need to be able to do, and connecting those, those functions to range of movement. How much range of movement is there at different joints um, based on the structure and the bones connecting them? So just as an overview, here are our synovial joints, our freely movable joints. You may recognize these from previous learning. We've got condyloid, saddle, ball and socket, pivot, hinge, and gliding. And this diagram is quite useful because it gives you a sort of a vaguely body anatomical example, but then also a diagrammatic interpretation of the structure of the joint. So it does show a bit more directly how different joints are structured or built in different ways to enable them to work differently. So gliding joints have gliding movements and are structured very differently to hinge joints, the cylindrical shape rotating in another bone. So we're going to look one by one at each of these six types of synovial joint, these freely movable joints. And also remember from the previous video that all of these joints have similar joint characteristics. They all have a joint capsule. They all have synovial membrane. They all have synovial fluid within the joint capsule. Um, they all have ligaments uh, stabilizing the joint and tendons and muscles working over the joints to create some level of movement. So first type of synovial joint, ball and socket. So what we can see on this anatomical diagram and on this diagrammatic version is that a ball and socket joint literally is, you know, is what it says on the tin. It's the ball round head of one bone that fits into the socket shape of another bone. And in this example, it's the head of the femur fits into the acetabulum, the socket of one of the hip bones. Now the, the function of, so structurally that's how it, it works, but functionally the ball and socket joints are multi-axial. They are the widest ranging joint. They have movements in all three planes and around three different axes. So the greatest range of movement of all of the different types of synovial joint. Just to note, um, we have ball and socket joints in two different locations. We have them at the shoulder and the hip. And structurally, the hip socket is a much deeper socket than the shoulder, or the shoulder socket is a shallower socket than the hip. Um, the shoulder has a much greater range of movement and a little bit less stability, but the hip joint is designed to be have that deeper socket to enhance the stability at that joint. We don't want that readily to dislocate. The shoulder joint is a little bit more vulnerable to things like dislocation because there is much more freer movement because the socket is shallower. So the list of movements that occur at a ball and socket joint are below here. So flexion and extension, abduction and adduction, horizontal flexion and extension, circumduction and rotation. As I said, the two places you can find a ball and socket joint are between the head of the humerus and the scapula at the shoulder joint and between the head of the femur and the ilium or the pelvic bone. Next, we have condyloid joints and I've put joints and I've put these this next because they're actually quite similar to a ball and socket joint, except for rather than having a round ball and a relatively deep socket, there is a more oval shape, a shallower ball. So it's almost described as elliptical, it's an ellipse. And again, the, the socket is a little bit shallower. So similar in principle to ball and socket, but the, the, the ball or the condyle, the bump on one bone sits in a fossa on another bone. And hopefully you remember from D1 um, 
bony landmarks. Condyle is a lump or a bump on a bone that sits in a fossa, a shallow hollowing or shallow uh, socket of another. Again, a bit like the ball and socket, we have ligaments over the joint that um, stabilize it to some degree, but also limit movement and it prevents, they prevent rotational movement. So you can't rotate your wrist, you can flex and extend it, and you can abduct and adduct it. Um, and with that in mind, that illustrates the fact that these joints are biaxial. They're not multiaxial. There, there's movement about in two planes, about two axes. So flexion and extension happens in one plane, in the sagittal plane, and abduction and adduction happen in the frontal plane. No rotation is possible at this joint, unlike ball and socket joints. So there's a little bit less range of movement. And perhaps the easiest example is the wrist. So the diagram here shows the wrist, the joint between the radius and the carpal bones, the short bones of the wrist, this long bone of radius of the forearm. Next, then we move on to gliding joints. So these are, again, the third type of synovial joint. All of these joints have uh, a joint capsule, synovial fluid, synovial membrane, etc. So these literally are where surfaces, often two, but can be more than two bone surfaces, have an element of contact but slide over each other. There's no pivoting movement about an axis. So literally they slide or glide over each other. So there's actually quite limited movement between these gliding joints. And that movement is again limited by ligaments. Ligaments are designed to allow the movement that's appropriate and restrict unwanted or unnecessary movement. And ligaments restrict the amount of movement that can happen at gliding joints. So these are not axial at all. There's no movement about an axis. There's just sliding or gliding movements over the two bone or more bone surfaces. Easy examples are the short bones in our body. So the wrist or the ankle, the carpals and the tarsals. And actually in our spine, we have gliding joints between the protruding processes of the vertebra. So on your back, if you lie down on a very sort of hard, solid surface, it's a bit uncomfortable. And that's because the spinal processes are uh, resting on the floor. It's not very comfortable. Between those spinous processes, there is a little bit of gliding movement. When we bend, when we flex and extend, there's a gliding movement between those spinous processes between your vertebra. The fourth of our synovial joints then, saddle joints. So the saddle joint structure is a little bit like the condyloid joint. Um, the surfaces, one snugly fits into another. This is not a deep ball and socket joint. It's a convex and a concave bone um, sitting in each other. Again, biaxial, so allowing movement in two planes, not multiaxial like the ball and socket joint was. If you imagine the saddle of a horse, um, given its name, it's got that sort of specific structure. Saddle sits over the horse's back and the two, and if you imagine the two bones being like the saddle sitting on or in the other bone and they fit snugly and move together. So this saddle joint, biaxial, movement in two planes and given that the movements are flexion and extension, abduction and adduction, we know that this flexion and extension is in the sagittal plane and abduction and adduction is in the frontal plane. So there is no rotation in the transverse plane allowed in these types of joints. You can't rotate your thumb. So the saddle joint typical example is the carp between the carpals and the metacarpals at the base of your thumb. You can bend and flex it and abduct and adapt it. So the fifth of our six types of synovial joint is a hinge joint. Um, so looking again at the diagrammatic version over here, this convex shape sits in a concave shape. So it's almost like a cylinder sitting in or wrapped, being slightly wrapped by another shape. 
and you can see as as in a door hinge we allow this kind of movement this flexion extension movement only the two places really three places really uh, hinge joints are available are the elbows the knees and your ankles so there's this one or uni axial movement so movement around one axis and in one plane and all flexion and extension is in the sagittal plane so at the ankle we can do dorsiflexion and plantar flexion and at the knee and elbow we do flexion and extension these of the different synovial joints have a smaller range of movement only movement in one plane and around one axis whereas the saddle and the condyloid joints allow movement in two planes so they are biaxial finally then uh, another uniaxial type of synovial joint the pivot joint so a common example of a pivot joint is the two top vertebrae at the neck here, the atlas, which, uh, which is the top one, and the axis, the one beneath it. And the axis has a peg, a part of the bone that basically sticks up, and it enables the atlas to rotate around it to enable us to look left and right. And that is a pivoting, rotating movement or rotational movement. So pivot joints are uniaxial. They only allow transverse movements or movements in the transverse plane, those rotational movements. Another example of um, a pivot joint is actually the radio ulna joint, less commonly known. This is your elbow joint and just below your elbow joint is the radio ulna joint. And it's a joint between the radius and the ulna. The ulna is perhaps the uh, uh, the bigger bone underneath. The radius is the bone that when you um, rotate your lower limb as if you were turning the ignition, the keys in an ignition, or doing spin in table tennis, that's actually your radio ulnar joint, not your elbow. So the head of the radius pivots around um, a notch in the ulnar bone. So it's slightly different from the atlas and axis, but both are um, pivot joints. This table is worth possibly pausing the video, having a little look at, um, just to be aware, plane joints um, are in our specification labelled as gliding joints. Um, we talked about planes and the movements that occur, so um, this column here identifies the number of planes that motion occurs in for each of these joints and it lists the types of movements and on the right here you can just see uh, these are the three planes that you need to understand in your specification i talked about flexion and extension happening in the sagittal plane uh, we've got um, abduction and adduction occurring in the frontal plane and any rotational movement is in the transverse plane Lastly, then, before we finish this video, you need to appreciate that um, the structure and the structures around joints are some of the important factors that affect the range of movement that a joint has. So the shape of the articulating bones, and we've talked through each of the types of synovial joint, and they're actually all designed. There's probably two or three that are quite similar in their design, ball and socket, condyloid, for example. Um, some are designed very, very differently. And so the actual joint structure and the bones and the shapes of the bones will partly determine how much range of motion is allowed at a joint. But there's also other things like the amount of muscle mass or the amount of fat mass around the joint. If you have a lot of fat around a particular joint, that will physically get in the way of the range of motion of that joint. And similarly with muscle mass, if you have some bodybuilders who have huge quadriceps or huge biceps, it's quite possible that the range of movement at the uh, elbow joint, for example, will be limited. Similarly, how tense or stiff or short ligaments are or the soft tissue that connects bones to bones or your tendons can also limit joint 
range of movement. And I, I think I mentioned in an earlier video that giving ligaments um, some work and some flexibility work is really undervalued in a lot of our training. So how flexible our muscles and our soft tissue, our tendons and our ligaments are, is really critical in maintaining a range of movement. And unfortunately, as we age, we also typically lose elements of, of mobility regardless.